Good morning, church. I want to wish the women in our congregation a very happy Mother's Day and those gathered online with us. Um, we want to take a moment to bless our moms and the women who have mommed us, um, who've protected us, raised us, fed us, nurtured us, corrected us, all the things, all the things. We're tired, we're grumpy, we're filled with grace, we say thank you. And we, all, we recognize and honor the fact that it is more than a biological function, that it is a holy function to be a nurturer and a caregiver and one who tends our body and our spirit and loves us. The scriptures um, show an example of what it means to be loved and tended as a mother, and it is a holy gift. Um, and so we say welcome and bless you, and we are so glad to celebrate this day with you. Um, as you exit today, there are cupcakes and roses to celebrate, and so please make sure that you don't leave um, before being celebrated and loved and blessed. Uh, a few announcements, just a couple. On your seats, you'll see these little slips of paper. Um, and this is a practice of our community. Every week, we invite you to write down one way in which God has blessed you this week. And then as part of the offering, we invite you to bring it forward and place it in the offering boxes. It is one way that we recognize that God is at work in our lives. Every week, they're gathered, they're typed up, and they are posted on our webpage as testimony to those in our community that might need the reminder that God is still doing good, that God is present, and that we are actively looking for how God does good. Because sometimes, before you can believe it for yourself, you need to see that somebody else sees God at work in their life. And so that's one way in which we do that. Coming up next Saturday, May 20th, is our food pantry distribution. And Judy is going to be out of town. But the bushes are going to take over. So Ida and Bruce, wave at everybody from the back. They are going to be here. So you got to show up to help. <laughs> they are not doing it alone. <laughs> you got to be here to help. So come next week, next Saturday at 9, 9.30. Which would you like? <laughs> the coach has spoken. We'll see you uh, at 7 a.m. ready to work out. Um, at 9, 9 o'clock. And 
the mom has said you can sleep for two more hours. So, <laughs> so be here at nine to help with the food pantry distribution. And then I um, need to say thank you and prepare you. Uh, again, one of the ways in which all of my colleagues want to be the pastor at this church, um, to be so loved. Thank you very much, church family. Uh, I was blessed and surprised with the gift to go see my sister. I leave Tuesday. And um, because you care and you're worried, clearly I've been a little sharp with my tone a couple of times. <laughs> Just kidding. It's to be loved so well. Um, so thank you for the generous gift. Um, if you don't already know, uh, I have been surprised with this gift to go visit my sister in California. I'll leave Tuesday, but I'm going to be off for two weeks. So I'll come back on the 22nd, but you still won't be able to get in touch with me because I'm going to hide out for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> and sort of recover and regroup and um, tend to my soul. And it is a huge, incredible gift to be part of a community and to serve a congregation that is equally invested in tending to the care of my soul as I am in tending to the care of yours. And so thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I have already posted my out-of-office email message um, after this morning. I come 11.35, I'm off duty. So <laughs> um, if you need anything, you can reach out to our board members or you can leave a message on the voicemail and email um, and somebody will figure that out and get in touch with whatever. As I've been told, I need to learn to let go. So I'm not going to, well, I'm going to try not to try to figure it out. Um, but um, you will be able to contact the church office get in touch with the board, it will all be okay. And thank you, thank you so very much for loving me so well. With that, if you are joining us online, I invite you to start passing the piece on that comment thread, much more than just good morning or glad to see you or glad to be here, but a blessing of one to another in the peace and grace of Jesus Christ. If you are joining us here in person, I invite you to take out your smartphone and check in on that Facebook thread and begin your passing of the peace with them as well um, to welcome them and to offer God's grace and peace. It is one way that we are trying to connect our online family with our in-person family. And so start doing that. And once you have done that with your very best parade float wave, I start with the choir because they're fun. <laughs> elbow, elbow, wrist, wrist, wrist. Make eye contact. Blow kisses if you want extra points. We're taking pictures from the back to post on Facebook. It'll be great. Um, and now let's turn our thoughts and our affections to the Lord as we prepare our hearts for worship. Would you please stand as you are able and join me in the call to worship? 
I will read the leader's portion, and if you would respond by reading the people's portion printed in bold. Let the whole world bless our God and loudly sing his praises. Our lives are in his hands, and he keeps our feet from stumbling. You have tested us, O oh God. Come and listen, all you who fear God, and I will tell you what he did for me. For I cried out to him for help, praising him as I spoke. If I had not confessed the sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened, but God did listen. He paid attention to my prayer. Praise God, who did not ignore my prayer or withdraw his unfailing love from me. Please remain standing as we worship God by singing songs of praise. the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings, who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all this is amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, that you laid down your life, that I would be set free. I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory. The nations with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. Down your life, that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you laid down your life, that I would be set free, oh, Jesus, 
I sing for all that you've done for me. Lord God, you are good. You alone are good, and you alone are worthy of our praise. So we come this morning to fill this place with our praise, that it would be a fragrant offering. God, knowing that you have already filled this place with your presence and that you invite us to draw close and to draw near, to be known, to be seen, and to be loved. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Our scripture today comes from the book of Acts, chapter 17, verses 22 through 30. And I'm going to invite you to read the scripture along with me. So Paul, standing before the council, addressed them as follows. Men of Athens, I notice that you are very religious in every way. For as I was walking along, I saw your many shrines. And one of your altars had this inscription on it, to an unknown God. This God whom you worship without knowing, is the one I'm telling you about. He is the God who made the world and everything in it. Since he is Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man-made temples, and human hands can't serve his needs, for he has no needs. He himself gives life and breath to everything, and he satisfies every need. From one man, he created all the nations throughout the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall, and he determined their boundaries. His purpose was for the nations to seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and exist. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. And since this is true, we shouldn't think of God as an idol designed by a craftsman from gold or silver or stone. God overlooked people's ignorance about these things in earlier times, but now he commands everyone everywhere to repent of their sins and turn to him. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Ooh, so there's, I feel like I say this all the time, but it's always true. There's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> Starting with just a few things, I want to put some context and maybe paint a little picture in your mind. So Paul is in Athens. He's looking at the statues and the temples of the Pantheon. Like it is a pluralistic worshiping community. They have a God for everything. And in this particular time, the Greeks are also in that space of seeking knowledge. They have placed a very high value on what is known and the philosophies of what is known and how to wrestle it apart, so much so that beyond the pantheon that, they have, that has already been established, they've created an idol to a god they do not know yet. Because, of course, if they haven't discovered all knowledge and all wisdom, surely there's another God. And Paul, when he is there and he begins to address the Athenians and all that are gathered, because it's a huge city and there are people from all over the known world in this place, it is a crossroads, he begins to address them. And he does what Paul does. He tries to find an inn. He is educated. He is from the Roman Empire. He is a Roman. 
So he has a different education than the vast majority, and he's able to relate to the Greeks in their pursuit of knowledge, the things that they know and don't know. And he says, I have seen. And he compliments them. Don't you always feel like when somebody starts with like these compliments in your own life, you're like, what is the angle? Right? You look so nice today. Da, 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 da. And then you're just waiting for the next shoe. You are so smart. You didn't know this. Um, <laughs> or it is easy to see by all of these temples and all of these idols that you are religious in every way. And it sounds at the very beginning like a compliment, and it's not. Because being religious and knowing God are two different things. And he says, I see you have this idol, this shrine for an unknown God. I can tell you who that is. And he begins his testimony, and he begins to teach. And he quotes a poet. So I found this fascinating, and I don't know why in all of my life. I've never bothered to look for it before. But he says, this poet says these things. And he's referring spe specifically to the verse where he says, in him we live and move and breathe and have our being." And we are all his offspring. So I, of course, had to go look up what that poem was, thinking I could find it from, you know, Jesus' time, or a little after, because frankly, this is after the resurrection. Um, Eratus, Eratus, my Greek is bad. If I had a Hebrew translation, I could do it better. But it's Greek, so there, that's what you get. Eratus, and the poem is Phenomenia. That was hard for me to say, too, because I just want to say Phenomenon. And the very section that this talks about is about Zeus and looking at the Agora at the marketplace. And you see people going to and from their work and to and from their purpose. And the poet, Eratus, is saying, Eratus, sorry, is saying it is Zeus that has given us purpose. It is Zeus that we please in the work that we do. And so Paul takes this thing that they would recognize, this poet, and says, mm, it's not Zeus. This is the unknown God. This, the, the things that you have ascribed to Zeus, this is to the unknown God. This is the God who created all things. And it's not just your purpose. It is your identity. It is who you are. Your poet says, we are all his offspring. And that's true of the unknown God, not Zeus. Those things that you ascribe to this deity, he's not really as powerful as you think. Because Zeus needs you. And God does not. Now, here's where I wish Paul would have pressed into better theology. <laughs> because Paul, because Paul cares what I think about his theology. If he had said, but he chooses you. God wants you. See, Zeus needs you. Needs you to be compliant. And if you aren't, he tricks you. These are the things they know about the pantheon and the gods of the pantheon. But God... The God, the one who created all things and created each of us, he doesn't need you, and he doesn't need your temple. And if Paul had just lined up with what I wanted him to say, he would have said, but God wants you. God chooses you. God loves you. For as your poets say, we are all his offspring. There's a beauty in that, specifically for us today as we celebrate Mother's Day, and in June we're going to celebrate Father's Day. And it's complicated. 
because we are all God's offspring. And God, the original single parent, is both mother and father. And so those places that we are nurtured and corrected, the places that we find our identity, they come from God, the creator of all, the one who gives us life and breath, who gives us purpose. In him we live and we move. For him we live and move. And because we are all his offspring, whether we know his name or not, whether we believe we are all his offspring or not, we are. And we belong to each other. We aren't just parent and child, we are brother and sister. And so the important teaching in this is he says, this God that you don't know yet, and this is one of the few times I take exception to the New Living Translation, because it's usually a little bit closer, but honestly, it's closer to the Hebrew than the Greek. In that translation, it should say, who you worshipped without knowing should read who you worshipped in ignorance. Not because you didn't know, but because you had created an idol. It isn't about the not knowing. It is about choosing an idol. About choosing a God that doesn't love you back. That doesn't love you first. I want you to take a minute and think about the things that really matter in your life. And if you struggle to figure out what really matters in your life, I'm going to give you a little litmus test to hold up. Where do you spend your time? Where do you spend your money? What do you talk about the most? No matter what you say your values and priorities are, those are the three things that actually determine the value and the worth of the things that matter in your life. Where you give your time, where you give your money, and what you talk about. That was a little painful for me this week as I wrestled into this text. That is not a, like, Michelle's illuminating thought for the rest of the world. That was the Lord calling Michelle to the carpet about Tuesday. (laughs) What really matters? What have we worshipped and loved and valued that does not love us first or back? What have we made a priority in our life or elevated in our priorities because it makes us feel safe or because it gives us the right sort of impression among other people? It validates our sense of worth, but cannot love us back. A good job, a nice title, a healthy paycheck, other people. See, we are his offspring. And I find it interesting on Mother's Day, the thing that we try to guard against, we we tell parents, don't find your identity in your children. They've got to grow up and become their own people. And you have a certain amount of time from birth to about, you know, the world likes to say 18, but let's be honest, at about 16, it's all over. (laughs) We have firmly entrenched in what we want to do and who we want to be. And we have just a couple more years to kind of shape and guide and move and influence. We say, you can't take the blame for all the things that maybe your children do that don't please you, and you don't get to take all the credit either. But here, in this identity piece, We find our identity in God because we are his offspring. And it's the only safe place to find our identity. He is the only one without fault or failure, without an ulterior motive, who loves us not because we are perfect or even trying to be, not because we're good, but because 
He created us. We belong to him. And so whatever our mess, we're loved. And we belong. We never stop belonging to God, no matter what mistakes we make, no matter what sins we choose, no matter what the rest of the world says. No matter when other people try to judge your integrity, your holiness, your anything, it doesn't matter what they think. God loves you because you belong to him. And maybe most importantly, you can trust that God loves you because he chooses you, not because he needs you. And that is a different kind of identity, to be wanted, to not be needed, to not have to live up to an expectation, to not have to be the perfect parent, to not have to be the perfect child but just to be loved and valued and treasured and cherished. We belong somewhere. And if we say that we are all God's offspring, then we are all God's offspring. And so it calls into question these cultural identities and shifts and labels and all the stuff, and none of it matters. I am a child of God. You are a child of God. The people outside are a child of God. The insurance adjuster that I try not to mention his name, he is a child of God. (laughs) The things, the people that press all of our triggers. Oh, they are children of God. And we can't give up on them because we belong to each other. Because we have a good and loving God who is a good and loving parent who sets the example and the moral standard, the example of endurance and long-suffering that only a parent knows and understands. We're all God's children. And so on days like today, when we specifically think we need to honor our moms, and we do, and the women who helped our moms raise us, we remember that that example is set in the Lord and in Christ Jesus and in the Holy Spirit. That they are one example of how God loves us, chooses us, calls us into belonging and into family. It's a big thing, and it can be a scary thing. But it's a beautiful thing to know that every person on our left and on our right, they belong to us, and we belong to them. And we have one parent, one eternal parent, who loves and cares for us and calls us by name. Will you pray with me? Lord, we love you and we bless you. And we find our place in you. We find our identity, our worth, our value, our hopes, our forgiveness, our peace of mind. All that you are, you invite us to share. All that you have, you invite us to partake. And all whom you love, you invite us to know and to bless and to heal and to gather together, to share a table, to share the one who loves us. Teach us to love. Teach us to love like that, Lord God. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
Would you join me in our profession of faith? I'll read the leader's portion, and we'll all read together the people's portion printed in bold. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love. As set forth in the example of our blessed Lord, to the end, that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. Oh, 
Lord God, as we come into a time of prayer, we begin by just taking a moment to confess, to confess our broken places, to confess our sin, to share with you our doubts or our confusion, our anger, knowing that in you there is a safe place that our confession isn't about condemnation or criticism, about being made whole, about finding relief and restoration. Lord, we give you thanks that even in our brokenness, you invite us to come with confidence and courage and boldness into the throne room of God, to ask for the things that we want and the things that we need, to trust you, to spend time with you. You invite us to find stillness and quiet and listen for you. to have conversation and know that it isn't an opportunity for you to tell us all the things that we've done wrong, but instead a way for you to tell us all the ways we are loved. All the beauty you have in store for us. How do we begin by lifting those in our community who seek your hand and your heart? For healing, for mercy, for compassion, for endurance, for respite. So we lift Dawn and Donna. Ed. Loretta, Scott and Laura, Jeanette, Ron, Kim, John and Melissa, Barb, Mary, the Beasley family, Roberto and Amanda. We lift Phil and Irma. And God, we take a moment to pray and lift our mothers. The women who gave birth to us, who adopted us, who counseled us, who healed our hurts with band-aids and hugs and kisses, who sheltered us and prayed for us, who dreamed big dreams for us, We shared our heartbreak. And celebrate our successes and our victories. Who hold on to hope for us when we cannot hope for ourselves. God, for those who do not have their mothers with them, whose moms have gone on to join the great, the great cloud of witnesses, we remember that we believe in a cloud of witnesses, that we are forever bound by your Spirit. 
and that they gather and they hover and they feast at the table with us. God, would you soothe that ache and that grief for the loss of the one that we cherish? God, we lift the mothers whose children passed on before them, who grieve the loss of their children. Would you comfort them? Would you speak words of healing and kindness for them? God, for those women who wanted to be moms and that just didn't happen biologically, but they have loved and raised the people around them who have given counsel and wisdom and comfort. God, would you fill that ache would you show them that there are countless of your children, grown and young, who need to be loved? God, for those women who are mothers and didn't want to be, who had their own battles and their burdens, their own struggles, their own broken places, and they regret the mistakes they made, the choices they made. Would you bring healing for them and for their children? Would you hold them both tenderly and bring reconciliation? would you teach us to hold each other tenderly like that? I invite you to share your prayer concerns, your joys using our mentee link. We can pray for one another and a Share one another's burdens. Celebrate one another's joys. Happy Heavenly Mother's Day to our mothers, Alva Gonzalez and Joanne Walk. Lord. For my mother and myself to feel better from health issues. God, for those in our community who are struggling, we ask that you would bring peace, bring rest. For those in our community who struggle with addiction, we ask that you would deliver them from that bondage, from that oppression, and that you would put them on solid ground and the exact right people in front of them to walk with them, to care for them, to get them the help that they need. For those in our community who grieve, who are stuck in that sense of loss, would you fill them to overflowing with hope, with the presence of your spirit that heals. God, for those things that we don't know how to give voice to, we don't know how to say, or even if we want to say it, 
we offer that part of our spirit to you to see into our darkest corners, our most vulnerable places, and we trust you, knowing that you are ever more ready to hear than we are to pray. I'd pour out your spirit, pour out your blessing. Bind us together as brothers and sisters because we are all your offspring. We love you and we bless you. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Now let us pray together as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now the time in our service where we worship God by bringing our gifts, our tithes, our offerings, and our sacrifice of praise. We have the two boxes up front. If coming down the center aisle to the front is not your thing, there are boxes at the very back and by the front doors. But come, let us worship God together. Take these gifts, bless them, multiply them, do with them infinitely more than we could dream or imagine. 
for the good of your kingdom and the glory of your name. In Christ Jesus we pray. Amen. generations and your family and your children and the children and the children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your coming and your going in your weeping Rejoicing, he is for you, 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 he is for you.
the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you. been blessed. Go in grace and peace to love and serve one another. In Jesus' name, amen.